What's up, Schmilville? Welcome to the first ever episode of the Meaning of Podcast. I am Ace. This is RB3. And it's here, guys. We finally have our own podcast. We're going to be talking about film. We're going to be talking about directors. And the first ever director that we want to talk about is Mr. Darren Aronofsky. Now, before we get into Darren and before we get into the meaning of his films, we want to talk to you about a little bit about what our podcast is about, essentially. Now, essentially, what we want to do in this podcast is bring you what our personal interpretation and what our personal identification is with each one of these director's films, right? So we're going to have a different director every week. We're going to run down their filmography or the filmography that we feel more connected to. And then we want to give what their interpret what our interpretation is for their films, whether it be symbolism, whether it be social commentary, whether it be metaphors, whether it be deeper meanings and messages, or or just w- it could be what we feel the film is trying to say, or what we personally felt in that moment during the film. So it's not necessarily you know this is what the director was trying to say. Period. It's more open to interpretation and the interpretation that you're going to get is RB3 and I's interpretation. So if we bring up a movie and he thinks of a certain moment in his life that, that, you know, reminded him of that movie, then that's what he'll talk about. It doesn't have to be about what the filmmaker wants to say. It's more about what we want to say about the filmmaker. So don't get mad if we don't bring up a certain message or a certain philosophy that we may have not talked about because we're going to be talking about what we personally identify with in the film. So obviously we're going to get a little personal RB3. I don't know if you're okay with that or not. Yeah, I'm always okay <laughs> with uh, digging in deep into uh, director's filmography, so this is going to be great. Yeah, so obviously everything is about how we personally identify with the meaning of each filmmaker, and Darren Aronofsky is a big one. Obviously, Mother recently came out, and Mother has become one of the most divisive films of the year already, mm-hmm. um, which to me is a little surprising. I mean... I don't know. To me, it just wasn't as shocking, I guess, as what people um, are saying that it is. Um, But yeah, it's a very divisive film and a lot of people are talking about it. So we want to talk about it, but we're going to talk about it at the end. First, we're we're going to spoil it too. So we got to say like... Yeah, we're going to talk about plenty of spoilers. Um, But let's start out with Darren Aronofsky in general. Let's start out with... Uh, let me start off with a question with to you. Um, what do Darren Aronofsky's films mean to you, RB3? Well, Aronofsky is funny. Like, when you look at his, his films, the way he constructs cinema, the way he looks at cinema, he's very much in a formalist kind of fashion. Um, he identifies a lot with the form of cinema, the art of cinema, um, the techniques that can be employed to enhance um, the narrative that cinema represents, um, kind of almost in, in an expressionist kind of way. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he often uses a lot of tricks with the camera, with the editing, with the sound, um, to fully immerse the character, fully immerse the audience into the character's perspective. Um, it's kind of giving the audience a subjective camera, you know, by featuring a lot of close-ups, featuring a lot of tracking shots, making sure that you are put into the... Uh, into the mind of um, a particular character. And that's what we see in a lot of his films, right? We see a lot of hallucinations. We see a lot of dream sequences, um, which normally I, I, I don't really enjoy dream sequences. <laughs> I think that's kind of, it's kind of a cheesy. Yeah. Um, but Aronofsky does it really well. And again, he puts he uses the subjective camera to put you um, behind the driver's will of the subject of the story. So yeah. that's what's interesting about him. Yeah, absolutely. And, and obviously... It, again, we're going to get what we feel and what I feel is, let's just say I took a huge deep dive into Darren Aronofsky a little bit more than I thought I would for this podcast in preparation for this podcast. Damn, dude. I, I just went, I told you when you came in today, I was like, dude, I went full, full Aronofsky to, like this week. Um, dude, I, I'm a, I think the guy's a genius. I think he really is like a mastermind. I, I, I I've been watching a lot of his films and, um, this is my thing, uh, being being on film sets, and I know you can probably agree with me on this. Um, a lot of people have said, "What is the main purpose of a director? What what is the what is the the main point of a director?" And I've always felt like the the most important thing a director can do is two things, and it's basically the same thing. It's I identify the character, tell the character's story in the in the narrative of the film. And when it comes to being on set, 
It's getting the actor to give the best performance in that character. And say what you will about Aronofsky's films, every one of his films features amazing performances. Absolutely amazing performances. And that's when you see talent. You see true talent in a director when they bring the best out of their actors. And I, and I feel like every single one of his movies, you have performances that are just legit, legitimately Oscar-winning performances with some of them. Yeah. And with others, should have been Oscar-worthy winning performances because they're so freaking good. Well, I mean, look at look at movies like uh, Wrecking for a Dream, mm-hmm. not for um, Best Actress from Ellen, um, Ellen Burstyn. Mm-hmm. Um, Black Swan, Best Lead Actress, Natalie, one, Natalie Portman. Portman, The Wrestler, um, Mickey, Rourke. Mickey Rourke, who was nominated in, in that year. Many people thought he should have won um, when they actually gave the, the Best Actor to somebody else. And um, and now there's a lot of buzz, obviously, surrounding Jennifer Lawrence's mother. Dude, I mean, it, absolutely, I agree with that. Uh, Jared Leto as well. Jared yeah, Leto, Jared Leto, Jared Leto kind of made his name with Requiem for a Dream. Um, and then uh, freaking, uh, you said Jennifer Lawrence with Mother. Dude, The Fountain, holy crap. Hugh Hugh Jackman, Jackman. Hugh Jackman broke my heart. Rachel Wise broke my damn heart in that movie. It's because of of her performance, and and that's based on Darren Aronofsky's talent as far as getting actors to truly feel every inch of emotion that he has for that character. Fun like, fact for, uh, I'm sorry. I cut no, you go off. ahead. Fun fact for the fountain though, um, Brad Pitt and, uh, and yeah. uh, Kate Blanchett were originally That's supposed right. to be. That's right. That's um, right. That's what he initially roles. he had in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah let's, uh, cool. I'm, uh, that's just my take with Aronofsky. Obviously what you were saying as him as a director as well. Um, he always, not always, but he really uses those tight, tracking close-up shots that makes the character look like they're going crazy like he does in Wrecking for a Dream he does it in Black Swan he does it in uh, A Mother Um, right right it's that it's that crazy mounted shot of the person's face and they're like just running around or something and then the camera's just on them the whole time when they're right right his his use of handheld uh, camera work is is really uh another factor and just beyond the camera you look at the lighting in his films Mm -hmm. I mean we're going to talk about the films individually, but um, every time it's kind of like a thematic thing in his movies. Every time there's a big dramatic moment where a character has to make a decision or there's a changing point, you always see like the light start to strobe, mm-hmm. um, you know, like the end of Requiem or mm-hmm. uh, Black Swan or, or, or The Wrestler. Um, of course, the sound design plays a huge part into um, everything that he does. Um, of course, the, the editing. Uh, he he kind of coined this his own term for his his editing style that particularly uses a lot in Pi and Rec Room for a dream. It's called a hip hop montage. Yeah, hip hop uh, montage. The direct quote that I have from him is that um, when I was in college, I was experimenting with this idea, and I think it came out of the fact that I grew up in Brooklyn in the '80s when hip hop was exploding. And I was trying to fuse the idea of sampling to storytelling. Um, so in the hip hop montages, his idea is that each uh, a rampant succession of cuts that are each defined by individual sound effect. Mm-hmm. Um, so in Requiem for a Dream, we see that anytime they're like shooting heroin mm-hmm. or, or whatever they're doing, um, and and Pi when when he's when he's having those long montages like math and all that stuff, um, and it's been so influential that a number of other directors have employed that. Edgar Wright uses it a lot now. Mm-hmm. Um, it, Joseph Gordon-Levitt used it, and Don John quite a bit. Um, so it's it's interesting how his formal techniques have transcended his own movies um, in just a shorter period of time. I mean, his first debut fo- um, feature motion picture was Pi, which came out in 1999. Yeah, um, I thought the, it was 98, but you probably know more than I do. Well, it, 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 I believe it debuted at the uh, Sundance Film oh, Festival in 1998, you, you. and he won Best See, Director. you're smarter than me, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I've been the, I'm such a big Aaron Oski fan, so I'm very excited to be talking about him. Oh, me too, um, man. Today. Honestly, yeah, man. I mean, what you just said right there, too... I keep thinking of, you know what I keep thinking of, RB3? Mm -hmm. His sound design, obviously the way he uses, not just, he does it a lot in Black Swan, um, Mother, and Requiem. Mm-hmm. Where it's 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 the it's the it's the gradual increase of sound effect, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's really really quiet and then really really loud and then it's like it gets in your face and you're like, oh, what happened? Like he did it a lot in Mother, mm-hmm. which freaked people out. That little the zzzz, mm-hmm. until it gets super loud. You know what I'm talking about, right? Right, right exactly. Cool. Yeah. I, mean, I feel like I'm looking at you like, what are you talking about, dude? No, no, 100. No, percent Um, the the increase in sound he did it with uh, the fridge. In Requiem for a Dream, mm-hmm. where it just got louder and louder and louder until it's mm-hmm. like so freaking loud. Like he does that really well. But one thing that a lot of people don't talk about, or at least I don't feel like they talk about enough, mm-hmm. is not just his use of sound design, but his use of score. 
Mm. Every single one of Aronofsky's movies features a score that will murder you. <laughs> like, yeah. legit murder you. Requiem for a Dream. Uh, um, Requiem Clint for Marshall, a Dream is, is an amazing, amazing score, amazing soundtrack. Uh, the Fountain is just, it mm -hmm. breaks your heart just listening to that song. And Black Swan, using the Swan Lake music and using other original music. Um, the, the, the way, it, it's not like he makes the music that makes it so beautiful. Obviously, it's the other composers that make it. But it's the way he uses the music so beautifully. Yeah. Like in the, in the ending of The Black Swan, when she, when she does the final dive and then the, mm -hmm. the music cres crescendos right. up to the final, like, da -da -da, da -da -da -da. it's just beautiful. And I'm just, I was watching Black Swan last night, um, re-watching it for like the third time. And just watching that scene again, I was just like, man, that's the perfect timing in music as well as in uh, um, The Fountain mm. and Requiem for a Dream, right? Because right? Because when he's doing that whole montage moment at the end, mm -hmm. he has that, da, 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 da. oh, and it yeah. kills you because you're just like, this is, oh, it, it went from like a cool kind of electro beat to like a horror soundtrack yeah that that theme Horror. became so iconic that yes. it became like every trailer music <laughs> yes <laughs> started using uh that soundtrack which i think it's volumes for. it's speaking of that let, let's just do it so what we're gonna do right now guys is we're gonna dive into some of his films i ordered it in a certain way we can jump around we don't have to follow this order but it's an order that i kind of liked um so we're gonna start with uh recreant for a dream right. um this movie this movie is Whew, this movie's a lot. This yeah. movie is considered to be one of the most disturbing, depressing, dark movies around. It yeah. really is just one of the most, like, it, it destroys you. It obliterates you. It makes you feel so terrible. And it really is due to the genius of Aronofsky's filmmaking. Whether right. it be the editing, the sound, the storytelling, the acting. Mm -hmm. It's just... Requiem for a Dream, man. I don't know. What are your thoughts on this movie? Because to me, this thing's a... I think it's a masterpiece the more I look at it. I mean, I rewatched it on Friday, and I was like, man, this thing's really a masterpiece. Right. I mean, I, I definitely agree. To me, it's, uh, to me, it's actually Aronofsky's uh, magnum opus. Mm -hmm. um, it's his best film. I, I think he'll have a hard time topping that. Mm -hmm. um, the performances in that movie, as we talked about, it was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Actress in a Leading Role. Um, we obviously saw the debut of... Not the debut, but we start to become familiar with actors like Jared Leto, Jennifer um, um, Conley, Damian Wayans Jr., which is <laughs> and actually... Um, Isn't that well, a Mar Marlon Wayans? Wayans. Yeah, Marlon Wayans. Yeah, my, my bad. Yeah, Marlon Wayans. Which is is mind blowing yeah. that he's in this movie. Yeah, um, and he's great. He is great. He's yeah, great in this movie. Um, you know, um, Aronofsky is kind of described this movie as an urban fairy tale. Mm -hmm. um, it is his. Uh, attempt with that along with Pi. We're not really going to discuss Pi a lot, um, but I think Pi is uh, amazing as well. It is. Um, it really is. And it, 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 it's his first beginning of the Aronofsky isms. That we're, right. We're right. Exactly. About. Yeah. This is debut feature, and of course, Requiem followed right after. Yeah. Um, in his in the featurette for Requiem for Dreams, the the uh, the Blu-ray he considers it urban fairy tale, a cautionary tale for the um, obsession and addiction, which. Yeah. We eventually see throughout his filmography, not just addiction to drugs, but addiction uh, and obsession of a particular goal of getting somewhere. Um, and what are the um, consequences of that? You know, what are his characters willing to put up um, in order to uh, achieve their goals or to um, feed their addictions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk about um, let's talk about the cast a little bit um, mm -hmm. now that you you haven't brought him up. Um, Jared Leto. I mean, Jared Leto. It's so funny because what Jared Leto is now is, you know, the Joker and people <laughs> calling him crazy and stuff right. like that. I love Jared Leto. I mean, just per again, this is all personal, right? So right. we're going to talk about what we personally identify with these films. I personally love the guy. I think he's great. I think he's an artist. Um, I love what he does with his music and I love what he does with his movies. Um, but it's crazy how he gives such a, a raw performance. There's that scene when he's driving away from his mom's place mm -hmm. in the car and he, and he starts to break down a little bit and then he 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 kind of stops himself and then breaks down again it's just it's just little moments like that that really make him a great actor and again i give all credit to Aronofsky for bringing that out of Leto cuz i feel like Leto is um a talent but i feel like a true director a true talented director brings it out of a of a performance now um remind me her name i'm sorry the mother um Ellen uh, Burstyn yeah she breaks my heart in this movie yes. man i mean she breaks my heart i mean the, the the whole 
like, the whole relationship between mother and son and the whole relationship between you know a son moving away from her mother and kind of forgetting about her and and a, and a mom's you know goal to want to feel a connection to to a to a son is is just so um, powerful and it's so well felt in this movie and that's why it makes it so much more heartbreaking at the end of the movie because right. you feel like that connection is crazy uh, Jennifer Conley breaks my heart in this movie especially at the ending of the movie mm -hmm. she gives probably her greatest performance ever I don't know if I can think of any other Jennifer Conley movie that is as amazing as she does in Requiem mm -hmm. um, every performance in this is just top notch it really is yeah and um, I, I think it definitely speaks to the talent uh, that he's able to uh, attract for these roles, right? I mean, um, I remember reading a story that um, when Ellen Burstyn and um, Jared Leto were having that scene in the kitchen where they were just talking to each other, like the DP uh, behind the lens was uh, had the shot like slightly out of focus, and it was like he couldn't he couldn't really see because his eyes like behind the lens were like actually tearing up uh, from from like um, her performance um, in that, and and you know the way he's able to define each characteristic why each character is motivated um to do what they are doing and why um and why they're in the position they're in now yeah and how they plan on going and achieving their goals is what defines uh how strong his performances are able to go because he's able to describe to the actors explain to the actors make it relatable to how to deliver that kind of uh powerhouse um statements and I think uh, speaking on on that character in particular, yeah, um, it kind of speaks to like the larger context of his filmography. Obviously, the relationship between mother and 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 child that we see throughout his uh, all his movies, all his movies, pretty um, much all his movies. Yeah, yeah, and, and the wrestler's a little different. We're gonna talk about that too. Even, That's even more about wrestler. fatherhood. You yeah, know? Um, but but it's um, still that parent child conflict. Right, right, right. Um, but we see we see particularly with with mothers and his films that they provide like a guiding light, trying to help their child and support their child in a way that you know a lot of um you know adult um ch children not adult children but um you know lineage of of a parent don't really want to listen to don't really sure. want to relate to and that's something that we all could get behind and that's why i think his, his films are so powerful is because he's able to relate those um broad strokes into like these interesting character pieces yeah yeah and obviously uh, we, we talked a little bit about the actual filmmaking you know of of Requiem for a Dream being one of the greatest I, I think one of the one of his best films and just a true masterpiece as far as editing music sound design the score the way he uses the score is phenomenal mm -hmm. the shot composition uh the shot selection um mm -hmm. the way he uses the mounted camera shot the one I told you about earlier right. about the the you know the crazy shot of the person and it's all close up and right, it's like right. following them around and they're like going like especially with her with the mother at the end of the film mm -hmm. Oh, it's it, it's such a it's haunting. It's a visceral shot, but but let's talk about a little bit about what he's trying to say in this movie. Mm. Let's talk about let's talk about drugs, RB three. <laughs> right, right, right. What do you what do you think about his message of as or as far as drugs, as far as addiction? Right, it's it's more about addiction than it is about drugs. Yeah, it's, I think it's definitely more about addiction, and um, of course, it's a commentary on how. Uh, pharm pharmaceutical drugs, prescription drugs mm -hmm. can be almost or if, even more lethal um, than what's out in the streets, what's out mm. with uh, heroin and cocaine and all that stuff that yeah. we all see explored um, in this film. And, you know, and in that he's kind of, this was coming at the time of um, the beginning of like the Bush era, you know what I mean? Like the early 2000s where um, we've been, fighting the war where america at least has been fighting the war on drugs war for on quite drugs, some yeah. time um we've seen a number of like pas and uh psas i should say and uh messages and message films about drugs and this one kind of subverts a lot of those tropes um instead of having like a happy ending where um there's some sort of relief or rehab it shows you the consequences of addiction yeah and where that could lead um characters or people in general yeah. um but and like I said, it's a commentary on the pharmaceuticals as well. How dangerous are those? And again, you know, the, the original book that is based on um, yeah. was written in the 1970s. And the book that is based on is also a commentary on like improper medical practices. Um, and updating the film for the 2000s, um, 
the, the, the film actually really doesn't have much of a time period. Mm-hmm. We don't see a lot of things that date the movie. Uh, the television that they use in there is obviously uh, a commentary on, on the media and whatnot. It's, it's fantasization of um, you know reality and whatnot. But uh, he kept the similar elements of the original book um, uh, talking about the improper medical practices mm-hmm. um, from the 1970s and even though those practices may be out of date now he still kept those in especially at the end with like the electrocution oh yeah uh, electroshock the, the electroshock therapy, therapy yeah, yeah and um, cutting off uh his the arm, arm. yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah. so um it's, it's, it's very fascinating what he has to say about it, those it's absolutely fascinating and again um i want to i want to take it in a different direction as well because it's it's that whole concept of addiction and drugs, and obviously you know this RB three, but a lot of people might not know this is my connection with it, <laughs> mm. which is a very I'm I'm the most hardcore straight edge person you'll probably ever meet. Yeah, uh, I'm super. <laughs> right. I I hate I hate the concept of of it, it's the concept of like you're addicted to drugs now take this drug to get off the addiction that you have to that current drug. Right. It's like. It's a circular cycle of 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 insanity of yeah. how it's unescapable unescapable drugs and drugs and drugs and 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 I I have a very connection to it because I I'm very anti drugs in the sense of like I don't do anything mm-hmm. I don't do any kind of drugs or any kind of enhancement to my body because I hate it so much right. even when it comes to like medical type shit unless it's necessary for my living of course but I've been to so many doctors and so many places when I talk about my trouble of sleep or I talk about this and they're like mm-hmm, cool story take this pill you'll sleep right mm-hmm, cool story take this you'll feel better and it's right. like I don't want to take that I'm yeah. here because I want to find a different way mm-hmm. and it, it's a it's a the drug obsession society that we live in is so apparent not just with illegal drugs but with like you said over-the-counter prescription drugs and stuff like that and pharmaceutical drugs um and it's just a downward spiral of being uh, so addicted to something that we're willing to give our lives up for it which is eventually what they do at the end of the movie which is which comes to jared little's arm jennifer conley just giving her body up which is disgusting as hell um to say the least and then it's hard to watch. It's yeah. hard to yeah. watch, dude. It's so hard to watch. And then obviously, um, Marlon being stuck in that crazy prison. Th- that right. scene is so. That's another. That's another example of the, like the the connection of, to motherhood. Yeah. He has that whole theme in the movie where he's longing to reconnect to his mom, but he can't do that now that he's um, locked up, um, you know, in jail in, in Florida. I believe that's where. Yeah. yeah. So it's 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 gnarly, man. And then obviously he feels there's a crap ton of racism in there when he's mm-hmm. in there as well, right, right. and mistreatment towards him because he's black as well. Right. And uh, um, obviously with the with Leto's mom at the end of the movie as well, um, just being completely destroyed. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you almost feel worse for her, mm-hmm. which you're supposed to, because it's such a, it's such a innocent, it's such an innocent want right. to want to lose weight. Mm-hmm. And yet for that innocent want, she completely destroys herself almost worse than anyone else in the film. Right. right. I mean, you can, you can argue for a lot of them, but it breaks your heart with the mom, especially with the ending of the movie being the fantasy of her, and Jared Little at the end of the movie being like, I love you, mom. Me too. You're yeah. on TV. And they're waving at the cameras and they're all happy. Right. Like that's what she always wanted. And her fantasy is not never completed. Right. Um, yeah. I mean the movie, the last 15 minutes of the movie when it's doing that crazy montage yeah. and, and the score is full blast kills you. Right. It murders you as an audience member. You're just like, God, this is horrible. Right. I feel like I'm watching a horror movie. And that's kind of what Aronofsky wanted to do. He wanted to make, a horror movie right. and a different type of horror movie and it, and it really hit because I, I don't know if i can rewatch that again because right. it's so horrifying even even though you get what he's doing and he does it so well aronofsky just murders your heart right. straight up and from a technical standpoint i mean the whole ending was so fascinating because you could tell like when you watch it um as they as the pace begins to pick up it's all like individual stories how they're you know how they're starting that whole sequence you know off individually but then as they start to uh get more and more involved it's like the cuts become faster the sound design actually before you start a scene um the sound of that scene will start playing before and it's like already like mentally prepping you like all right here it comes here it comes and then boom this the imagery becomes like way worse way more exploitive and um and it almost kind of blends all of their struggles together. Like, oh, yeah, they're in the same boat. You know, sure. this is where addiction leads. No matter who you are, no matter what background you come from, 
addiction is so powerful and so lethal and so dangerous that it will just destroy lives. So yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. Is that your last word on Ricky for a Dream before yeah. we move on? Yeah, that's definitely my cool. last word. Cool. My last word is I love that shot of uh, Marlon and Jared Leto when mm. they're in prison. Right. And it, and it does that crazy like and sh- shaking. Yeah. And then Marlon screams. He goes, help me. Right. That shot to me. That's just pure filmmaking. Mm-hmm. It's amazing. Cool. Um, let's jump over to um, two of his other films. Um, let's start with... Um, I kind of want to jump into both of them, but let's start with The Wrestler and Black Swan. Okay. Um, two films about um, people who are very much... Um, motivated by motivated. their work. Yeah, um, by their craft. Yeah. So this one, obviously, it got Mickey Rourke a nomination and it got Natalie Portman the Oscar. Mm-hmm. So that's another testament to... Um, what Aronofsky does with performances and what he does with um, characters. Because mm. it's crazy, like, uh, rewatching Black Swan last night, like, like I said, just, you get so much out of Natalie Portman in 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. You, see, you see her face, you, you see, just visually, right? Mm-hmm. You see, she's, she's young, she's super freaking skinny, um, but she's not too young, where you're like, wait a minute, why are you still with your mom? You look like you're 26, maybe? Um, she's an obsessed dancer and she's very like, the way she holds herself is very proper, very like refined, very like, I don't want a grain of dust on my shirt. Um, and you get that in 15 minutes of Black Swan. Like that to me is just, that's how good Aronofsky is at at identifying a character, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're like, I know who that is and she really hasn't said anything yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's one thing that I very no- much notice in, in in the way he does characters in right. in Black Swan and in The Wrestler. Right. Um, you know, I think from from a stylistic point of view, um, these movies are are very different, but thematically they're almost the uh, almost the same, right? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, I think a lot of what Aronofsky's films are uh, one man or in one woman versus the world, but in The Wrestler and Black Swan, it's like. Um, yourself versus yourself. Yeah, you know what I mean. They're they're fighting um, their 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 individuality uh, or their their perception of individualism um, to trying to overcome that in order to strive and get to their goal. And again, it plays into the idea of uh, obsession mm-hmm. and um, addiction. I mean, yeah, Ricky um, 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 Mickey Rourke's character is like obsessed with with wrestling he's addicted to it he, he can't retire even when he retires he's just thinking about it he's trying not to um yeah you know get back into that lifestyle but it just keeps calling to him yeah and he, he, again he's like he's fighting himself it's like the duality um within his own mind and of course in black swan that that actually meticulates Happens. visually yeah, yeah. <laughs> she seems like a clone of herself yeah uh, like you know like evil clone in this and that's where i think like the style differences come in sure um you know definitely the wrestler is probably the most grounded aronofsky movie it is. we're ever going to see uh that's it, a very good point <laughs> yeah that's a very good point man. i mean that's definitely that's the most you know linear narrative mm-hmm. storytelling face value movie right we're ever going to get from an Aronofsky. Right. And it's, and I think it's attributed to um, the subject matter, obviously, and it, because when you're doing a film about wrestling, it's easy to make it look like it's a joke, it's, it's supposed to be funny, but uh, it's a very serious profession for a lot of people. It it's is. Some people's dreams and some people's goals and some people's ambitions. So telling it from a real, and it's, um, realistic um, standpoint is, is, I think really helps it. And it's, and it's a, and it's a whole different world, right? right. It, it's a, it's a different world that a lot of people don't know about, which is why I like that he brought it up. It's funny because I've talked to you about it. I've talked to a lot of the schmoes about it. Um, you know, like Christian, Ken, Mark, um, uh, a lot of different people in the schmoes grew up with wrestling. To, mm-hmm. to an extent of like obsession and love and just like this is their life. Mm-hmm. I was one of those people. And I know you know that as well. I've mm-hmm. talked to you about it. Um, wrestling was, professional wrestling was my life, dude. Like the mm-hmm. WWE, I ordered all the pay-per-views. I freaking wanted to be a professional wrestler like for a very long time. Like it didn't just die when I was like, oh, when you're really little, you want to be. No, no. I wanted to be one until I got up to like 12, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, I really wanted to be a professional wrestler. It was my life. Like the, the character, the stories. Um, so watching this movie for me and watching what, what Mickey Rourke goes through, what a lot of people don't know that the wrestlers actually go through a lot of pain mm-hmm. so much that they're addicted to painkillers, that they actually mm. obsess over their appearance and with roidings or with doing roids or um, getting into character, um, uh, um, getting no, learning all the moves that they need to mm-hmm. learn before when they get in the ring, um, as well as um, I love, you know what, what, what I love too? 
the hardcore wrestling scene. Mm. That scene right before he has a heart attack. Right. That's one that a lot of people don't know about and that a lot of people don't view. There, there's, there's, a, there's a very fine line between professional wrestling, WWE, and ECW hardcore rules wrestling, mm-hmm. which is it, it's a line that a lot of people didn't really want to cross. Mm-hmm. But I, I do. As, as I was watching that, I was like, crap, hardcore wrestling. I love hardcore wrestling. Mm-hmm. The thumbtacks, the freaking chairs. The, the barbed wire bats, like all that lifestyle of how, how it's the same thing, but it's not the same thing at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and how that he's willing to do crazy things to his body. Like the staple scene. Right. When I, I was just like, don't do it. Don't yeah. do it, man. Like that whole thing to me was. And he, he even holds it there like for a second. Yes. Like, like it's building suspense. Like, don't do it. Nah, You're like, no, dude. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll take the bat. I'll take the chair. Right. I'll take the freaking barbed wire. But don't freaking staple me. And it's right. something so little. But you're just like, nah, bro. <laughs> mm-hmm. But for me, it's like that that whole wrestling mentality in, in the wrestling world. And kind of destroying your body really you really are destroying your body when you're put through that many years of wrestling and he's so he's he looks so he looks so old in the film yeah. too and he, i mean obviously he's an older guy but he looks so much more fragile and old um that he, aronofsky does a really good job of like selling the veteran wrestler who's been doing this for so long and he's so obsessed with it and he's so addicted to it that he literally gets rid of his family for it right. and he like pushes away his daughter so much that it's just his only family left is the crowd, is the audience. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I love that about The Wrestler. Yeah, and, and again, um, like I said, it, it, it strives for realism. Um, you know, there's not a lot of flashy editing. There's mm-hmm. not a lot of crazy camera work. Um, and I think in doing that, he's able to really get into the heart and the meat and the grittiness of the world, of the people. Because when you meet like side characters like Marissa Tomei's, um, oh yeah. Uh, character. She she's dealing with a lot of her own personal strife, being, being a stripper, but trying to provide for her her child and, and whatnot. And you know, I think is this this movie is the um, w- is Darren Aronofsky's way of getting into the heart of like a middle America kind of um, crowd. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, most of his other movies are set in like New York. Or or Los or I don't know if he has a movie set in Los Angeles. Actually, I don't think but, he does. No. Um, but his his movies are, are more about like broad strokes of um, of society sure. of of commentating on um, urban and, and, and suburban. But um, this movie is like one that just solely focuses on the heart of his of, yeah. of, of his people and his characters and. It's a small little community that it involves itself in, so I think it's really interesting. And then once we turn over to something like Black Swan, it, it becomes a lot more. It's, it's still the same principle, obviously. It's, it's still set in New York, I believe. Yeah. Um, but it again, it, it hones in on why dance is so important to Natalie Portman, why ballet is so important to these people, why is it so important to her mother, why is it so important to the um, Malia Kulis character? Yeah. Um, and why. Uh, People are motivated to pursue those crafts and what what goes lies ahead of them for them. Yeah, it, it, to me, it's also it's also a commentary on personality and just right. and just the the the. It's crazy because that that movie. Just thinking about it now, I didn't plan this out at all, but it also kind of reminds me of uh, Nocturnal Animals, hmm. which is is that there's there's always a line or not always, but there there's a line between people when they start to to break down. In a certain way, right? Because right. in Nocturnal Animals, it's Jake Gyllenhaal's character, where he's pushed and he's pushed and he's pushed, but he he never he's never willing to go all the way. He's just he's just not willing to push far enough. And that's the same with Natalie's character mm-hmm. of Nina, where she she's so refined and so detailed and so I want to be perfect. I want to be perfect. I want to be wholesome. I want to be right, but I I can't let loose. I can't give myself away. I can't let go. I can't push that boundary of willing to compromise who I am as what she thinks she is, right? Because she thinks that I'm this very proper, nice, pretty girl, and I don't do that. Mm-mm, that's that's not that's not correct. I'm a, I'm a ballet dancer. I'm very, you know, like she's always this very like character who's not willing to push herself all the way. And when the craft requires that to push yourself and to, to do you have it in you whole of, whole thing, right? right. Uh, of of breaking down that wall within yourself and becoming 
a, a different version of yourself, which is the Black Swan for her, right? And I love how Aronofsky, he takes the story of the of Swan Lake, right? right. Which there is actually a story to yes, it. Yes. Yes. Um, and he and he makes that that underlying theme, and he makes it the actual movie. I love that how right. she's like. Well, I have to become the Black Swan, and then she kills herself because she's a lo- she's in love with her lover, but her lover, you know, cheated on her with someone else, and it's that whole progression of that story that drives the character itself. And I think that's so fascinating because her progress or her progression to become the Black Swan or become the darker version of herself is is what the movie's all about. It's all about Natalie breaking down that wall. And, 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 and getting behind the whole, like, living with your mom till you're, like, 30, uh, being super proper, not eating anything, never willing to, to live a little. Like, they say in the film, they say it twice. Mila Kunis, Mila Kunis says it to her, and uh, the professor says right. it to her, the dance instructor. They say, hey, live a little. You know, let loose. Get a little more wild. Three things that she's never done. She's never let loose. She never gets wild because she's always so addicted to herself and the way she is and to the craft and when she does start to break out that's when the trouble starts to hit exactly that's where um the consequences of her action really start to catch up with her and i think that's interesting that you bring that up because there was actually like a line in the original script that was cut out of the movie where um the dance instructor tells her like and i'm, I'm paraphrasing here but he basically says you know unlike music or unlike paintings um what that lasts forever dance is fleeting it's about living in the moment now and being in that and being in that moment and, yeah. and experiencing that that's good and that's and i think that's indicative of the overall theme of the movie mm-hmm. is that um once you go out and branch out and live that's when you can finally succeed especially in something like performance uh that you're able to uh, that you're able to uh be your best you in your performance you know that's when she becomes the swan king when she finally lets it all go when she's re- ready to um you know ready to give her all to the craft um, and, and live in that moment. Yeah, it, it, it really is. And it's one of those things where it stays with you, not in a recording, but almost in, a, in, in the back of your mind or in your soul, right? Mm-hmm. A performance does, or right. an amazing performance where you're just like, you, you capture that moment and it's, and it's in your mind and you remember that. that mm-hmm. that's, a very, that's a cool line. And, it, and it's also like, it, it, just that progression of her becoming the black swan in the end. And like you said, taking it too far. Right where she where she wants to go, she's like I can't I can't break out. And then when she breaks out, she breaks out so much mm-hmm. that she just goes so far that she loses her mind and that she really starts losing herself in the craft in a way that's like uh, the dance instructor says in the movie, dangerous. Right, where, where you're so you're so powerful in 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 the way you bring um, dancing to life that you're almost a danger to yourself. Mm-hmm. Because you, you don't know where they're going to do or what they're going to do. And that's what makes her so dangerous in the movie. Right. And uh, I think that ties back into what we were just talking about, the wrestler. Same thing with like the live performance, being in that moment, being in the crowd, um, and really really following your, your, your dreams to, to conquering that. So. I, I was just remembering the moment in the, in the movie when he's like, uh, when he gets next to the guy who's in the wheelchair and he has mm-hmm. the, the robotic, uh, the metal leg. Yeah. And he's like, use the leg! And he's like... And everyone's like, use the leg, use the... And I'm like watching the movie and I'm like, dude, use the damn leg. <laughs> and he's like, in that moment, he's thinking to himself, that's weird. And then he's like, I got to use the damn leg. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I got to use the leg. But um, I don't know why I brought that up. I just thought it was a funny moment in the movie. <laughs> but um, speaking of moments in the movie, when she finally gives her Black Swan performance, mm. it's so freaking good. I can't lie because I remember watching – every time I watch a performance movie, like whether it be Whiplash, which is another one, right. at the end of the movie, I'm legit cheering because mm. I'm, I'm, I'm so invested in the movie. And, and when I have a space, which is my own personal house, and I don't have to worry about moviegoers, mm. I start cheering. Like, I legit start cheering. And I remember watching when she does the Black Swan performance, and I'm like, yo, let's go, girl. Get it, girl. Let's go. And she starts going off, and she gives an amazing performance. Yeah. Like, a really, you're just like, damn, Natalie Portman did that? Right. Damn. And there's that one shot that always stays with me, which is when, when she's the Black Swan, and she's in all the makeup and stuff, mm-hmm. and she has those crazy eyes. Right. And then she, she does the, the fleeting towards the camera, and then right. flee away from it, mm-hmm. where she goes towards the camera, mm-hmm. and then away from the camera. And then she does that eyes connection to you, and the camera zooms in and then zooms out. You know what I'm talking right, about, right? right? Yeah. God, that's so good. It right. really makes you feel like, man, she really did become 
Black Swan, this teacher is good, man. <laughs> right, right. And I think that's that's just another tribute to uh, the filmmaking that they yeah. able to use. That camera work. Um, he used the, uh, the same DP on, on a lot of his films. I have to, I'm going to pull up his name right now. But, sure. Um, the way that the tracking shots and the zoom shots and the, and the movement shots are orchestrated are so in a way that you're always um, following his character. And it, particularly in the, in the dance sequence, um, you know, you see a lot of when 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 she finally starts letting uh, go of herself, letting out. Um, it goes from a lot of close ups, a lot of medium shots of her actually doing the performance, then the wide shots, kind of representing the audience and how they're wowed. And um, and when whenever you cut to the audience or whatever, it's it's, it's fascinating. So that's why I think um, that perform, you know, especially in shooting a performance, it's tough because you don't know how compelling it would be to a cinematic audience just yeah. watching a live dance or in the case of like Whiplash, like a live drumming or or uh, the wrestler with the wrestling. But um, he's able to to use, uh, he's able to shoot those sequences in a way that isn't like cheesy or isn't like over the top, but feels real and feels natural yeah. and that you can really connect to. Cool. Um, I'm going to say my last word on Black Swan and the wrestler. Um, uh, for the wrestler, it really is uh, wrestler and Black Swan. The, the thing that really stands out again, obviously, starting this conversation was the performances of Mickey Rourke and Natalie Portman. Right. Um, their transformation. M- Mickey Rourke with learning how to wrestle, becoming enormous, legit huge right. as far as buff wise, um, and learning the motions of wrestling with Natalie Portman becoming a ballet dancer. Like, damn, she was a re- she legit became a dancer, um, transforming her body. And, and showing the destruction that ballet does to a girl's body. It destroys her body. Like, their feet are messed up. Right. They're, they're, they're so skinny that they look just deformed in the sense mm-hmm. of, like, you can't eat anything because it's, it's, it's just not... Not only is it not aesthetically pleasing, but it's not... It's easier to be light on Ooh, your feet. Right. Be light on your feet when you're that skinny. And, and the way that Natalie Portman legit gave her whole body and soul into that performance is 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 just to me is the thing that stands out the most in mm-hmm. black swan and in the wrestler right and i, and I didn't mention before and i, I kind of wish i would have mentioned it in the, in the record conversation as well but the way that uh darren uh uses mirrors and his actors looking into mm-hmm. mirrors and it's kind of a moment of self-reflection right yep we see that in the wrestler before he like when he's like looking in the mirror, he's like judging his own aesthetic. You kind of talked about that a little bit before, um, and of course, and Black Swan is even taken to the next level where her reflection, her mirror, is actually becoming its own manifestation. Yep. Um, where she's fighting, like like we mentioned before, the duality of um, herself, of herself, a, almost like a doppelganger version of herself. Right, which I think plays heavily into um, his theme of you know the biggest battle you're going to fight is against yourself and once you win that battle or lose your battle what's the end consequences absolutely so. cool um let's move over to uh, a, a recent favorite of my aronofsky films which is called the fountain mm. damn this movie this yeah. movie is wild dude it's, this it's, 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 it's out there it's <laughs> out there it's le- legit out there it's literally out there um do you know what's crazy i remember watching a little bit of this movie a while back, right? This came out in 2006. Yes. Um, I remember watching a little bit a while back, never really paid attention to it. Mm. Rewatching this movie that I rewatched it a couple days ago. Holy crap, man. This movie's out there. And I freaking love this movie. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't know why it stuck with me so much. I feel like you might disagree with me. Most people will probably disagree with me, but I feel like everyone's talking about Mother. I feel like this is his most ambitious film. I feel like as far as ambition, as far as out there, as yeah. far as like really dealing with themes that are crazy and really dealing with layers of metaphors and layers of symbolism, I feel like this one, even more than Mother, I feel like Mo- Mother is really cool and it has, you know, metaphors and symbolism, but I feel like the metaphors and symbolism are, you can catch it, you can grab it. This one, it's like you try and grab it, but it slips away from you. Mm-hmm. Like it's just so larger than life, legitimately right. larger than it life. Is. Um the thing that stands out again to me in this movie um, is is the relationship between Hugh Jackman and Rachel Wise. I obviously I love Ra- uh, Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman's my boy. Mm-hmm. Hugh Jackman's my brother. He's he's Wolverine for life, and he's right. an amazing actor. He gives uh, enormous, almost Oscar-winning performance in this movie that goes completely unnoticed. Right. And Rachel Wise, 
is is someone that I've loved since. Um, for anyone out there who's a fan of the Brendan Fraser mummy movies, mm. which I love the yeah. Brendan Fraser mummy movies, I freaking love her. Like, I remember watching her in those movies and being like, man, I love this woman. Like, as a kid, like, I'm like eight years old, right? Mm. Um, and then her in this movie, man, I love this woman. Right, right. <laughs> like, she's so good. Like, every moment, you could see her her body starting to decay. Um, and, and you could feel it. You could really feel it. And you could feel her love for Hugh Jackman's character and the love that Hugh Jackman feels for her. But I almost feel like... He leads this movie, but I almost feel like she might even take this movie from him in the mm. sense of like how much she gave me with the little she was in. Right. But um, yeah, I don't know. What are your thoughts on this movie? Just general thoughts. Um, general thoughts. I mean, I, I, I think this was, um, it was a tough movie to get off the ground for Dan mm-hmm. and I was going to make. Um, and I think the reason being is because it's so out there. It is. It's so, you know, it involves numerous different timelines, different stories. Um, how those all intersect with the idea of the uh, fountain of youth, Mm -hmm. um, the meaning of life. I think it's Darren Aronofsky asking a lot of questions that he's been asking himself for a long time and putting it all on film and and trying to transcribe them in a way um, that relates to him the most. And I think that's really fascinating. Um, I think the movie is um, probably one of the most interesting um, religious pieces Mm. I think I've I've ever watched um, in the sense that it really is about transcending belief and mm-hmm. how um, and how once we believe in something and once we start to um, look at something as the story of you know life or the story of meaning or the story of self, how we maybe might be able to transcend that mm-hmm. um, and that's what um, I think that's what's, what's really crazy about the the, the fountain I, I I enjoy that movie a lot um, you know I don't know if it's my favorite Aronofsky movie. Okay. Um, you know, it definitely has like a lot of moments where I have to, oh, what's, what's happening here? You know? Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm not sure if I even still fully understand what See, the movie that's, is. But that's what so. I, that's what I'm trying to say. Right. I, I, that's what I feel like. That's why I like it so much because it, I feel like it's the most ambitious Aronofsky film because there's still so many moments that I'm like, I honestly don't know what that meant. Mm-hmm. Whereas in Mother, I can kind of I can kind of give you my interpretation of it. And it's right. a pretty educated guess. Right, right. Whereas I give an educated guess for The Fountain and I sound like an idiot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where I'm just like, is it about his, do- do- I don't know, his yeah. love or his wife? Like, I don't know. I can't tell you. Yeah. Because it's so out there and it's so ambitious and it's so... Um, it's such an interesting film, and I and I, I I love how you bring up the structure because it's a it's a nonlinear structure. Yes. Um, and it's and it's done in in three three versions, right? So mm-hmm. it's so it's Hugh Jackman and Rachel Weisz as um the the queen in Spain and the conquistador, not conquistador, explorer, yeah, I, I, yeah. kind of like an explorer type person who's in search of the fountain of youth, and that's kind of the book that Rachel Weisz's character is writing when it comes to modern times and in modern times it's Hugh Jackman as a as a doctor mm-hmm. as a surgeon who is trying to find a cure for his wife's cancer right. so he's doing a lot of exp- it's experimental surgery is what right. it is right there's so there's doctors who who actually do experimental surgery and their goal and their whole thing is just doing experiments 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 on animals right mm-hmm. because you can do it on animals that's legal you can't really do it with humans um so he's doing experimental surgery in order to find a cure for his wife's tumor. And in the future, it's Hugh Jackman's character as like this weird, bald, yeah, freaking like booty, looking. Buddhism, yeah. monk looking guy who's like traveling to space in a giant bubble <laughs> yeah. with a giant tree that he talks to and eats from. Like that one is so out there that you're just like what's going on but it's what it is it's like it's supposed to be like a future version of him Mm -hmm. who's like traveling in a a spaceship that's like an organic bubble um and that tree at least what i think it is this is all me right um i think it's rachel wise in that tree and it's that whole concept where she says it in the movie where it's like a lot of people in the mayan um um you know culture they would bury their ancestors with trees and with mm-hmm. seeds mm-hmm. so that when they grow, they can be legitimately like brought back to life, be almost. brought back to life with that tree. So right. every fruit, every branch, every, every touch of the tree is a touch of that person that you're now touching. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very interesting concept. So what it is, it's Hugh Jackman, you know, traveling to what they believe to be, 
the Mayan, um, almost heaven, I guess, almost Mayan afterlife, which right. is the nebula star system. Um, I think the name of it was Shibobov, Shiboba? I believe, yeah. Um, Shiboba, which is the Mayan version of heaven. Um, and it's Hugh Jackman trying to legitimately, physically reach heaven in order to be reborn with his wife on earth. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. crazy. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's, it's some heady stuff, dude. It's, it's really is some crazy stuff that I, 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 I appreciate it so much. I really do because it's stuff that it's, it's beyond religious. It's physical religion. Right. And it's, it's funny, um, you know, when it was initially released, it has like mm-hmm. a 51% on Rotten Tomatoes. Mm-hmm. Um, made like no I, money at all. Made no money. $15 million worldwide on a $35 million budget. No money. <laughs> um, so it, it, it wasn't successful uh, critically or commercially, but over time it started to build like a, a following, yeah. you know? And um, I think it's... It, and it's funny, you know, I was watching an interview with Aronofsky and he said that the fountain is uh, what he believes is like closest to his own beliefs. I heard that, beliefs. yeah. The, he yeah. said that's that's the closest thing do I have to a, like a belief system. Right, right, So right. like that's his religion where I'm trying to like, I'm like, that's crazy. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you believe in a star system that'll blow you up and to be reborn? Sure, man. More right. power to you. I, re- I actually respect that. I think that's cool. Right. That's cool that he... That he makes like a real version of like his religion right um, and some would even you know uh look at uh his um uh, some would even look at what what he what he puts on display there as um maybe a metaphor for christianity or it's sure. not a metaphor a commentary on it or uh how like his visual visual perception of heaven or yeah um or hell or or you know whatever 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 fashion you want to look at it sure um you know some i've seen some interpretation saying that the future timeline is, you know, maybe like, um, the afterlife above the, the regular, you know, the, the modern times is like what we live in, like on earth, um, the times, uh, you know, from the past or like from under, you know, from, from the, yeah. hell or whatnot, you know, there's, there's numerous ways to read this movie and sure. I have no idea how to. I, I don't know either. This, this is, this is the biggest anomaly i feel for aronofsky and, and and that's such an interesting point to bring up christianity because again we're going to talk about it a lot in mother and in noah but mm-hmm. i consider myself to be a very spiritual person and, and to be a part of the christian faith but in in a different way and looking at it with the aronofsky eyes it's it's when, when you when you when you believe in god and when you believe in heaven you don't believe it in a physical manifestation you believe it in a physical manifestation but not quite something you can physically attain right yeah we're, we're or something you can visualize exactly whereas in this movie the concept of like physically reaching heaven mm-hmm. like if i got in a spaceship and i tried to go to heaven i can legit go to heaven it's like no no you can't as a christian you don't believe that mm-hmm. but the fact that he does believe that and he says yeah you get in a spaceship and you freaking go up there and you try to reach heaven to try and be reborn again is interesting and also um the tree of life I thought that was such an interesting right, point right, where right. it's where it's like, no, there, the Garden of Eden is real, was real. God did make the Garden of Eden. Um, the tree of knowledge was something that, you know, eating from the tree of knowledge was, was something that God didn't want Adam and Eve to do. But the right. tree of life was also um, something that God made and reaching the physical tree of life, like the actual fountain of youth, right? Mm-hmm. Th- th- that concept to me is so interesting. Like, what if God actually did leave artifacts or did leave creations that are still perfect right. and that are not tainted by sin? Right. Like those, it's mind blowing. I'm just like, wow, that's crazy. As a Christian, I'm like, what if he did do that? Right, <laughs> like, right. Aronofsky reaches those themes that are just so interesting mm-hmm. and and so mind boggling. Like, it really is a, a concept that you're like, I don't know. It's a good point. What if there is a trail of life that we haven't found yet and it's hidden somewhere? Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and I, I totally agree with that. I think what, um, you know, I'm not familiar with like Mayan um, religion. Yeah, me neither. Or, yeah. you know, stuff like that. So I don't want to speak, you know, negatively or, or speak ignorantly, I should say, about, about those topics. But um, at least from my, inter- I mean, we, we talked about before, you, you're, you're very Christian, um, or spiritual, I should say, uh, if, you know, and you practice Christianity mm-hmm. a lot. We both did. I went to like a Christian school for a lot of my life as well. Um, so in reading um, and watching the film and kind of reading the subtext of it, um, it's kind of hard not to put like a, a spin on, on Christianity and whatnot on it, at least from my perspective. Sure. Um, 
But that being said, it's, it's, it's definitely um, an exploration, experimental exploration that um, we'll see continued. Uh, in in throughout other his, of his, his films. films. Yeah. I, I, to be honest, last word on, on The Fountain. I love it. I think the score is still so beautiful. Yes, yes. Um, Rachel, Rachel Wise, uh, Please Marry Me. <laughs> uh, Hugh Jackman, you can be at the wedding as well. <laughs> um, let's move on to Noah. Um, let's actually let's do Noah and Mother at the same time. Um, yeah. Well, um, do we want to throw up like a spoiler thing for people who haven't seen Mother? Sure. Um, um, yeah, if you haven't seen Mother, uh, we're gonna spoil it. Yeah, unfortunately, let's um, go see Mother so yeah. you can be a part of this podcast. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, Noah. No, it's funny because leading up to Noah, they marketed this movie as like a biblical epic. Get ready yeah. for an awesome Bible movie. It was very much marketed towards the Christian demographic, mm -hmm. um, which probably was a mistake. It was. Um, I believe Definitely so. a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then again, as I said before, as watching this movie as a Christian, and, and especially someone like watching it with my family, right? Watching it with someone like my dad, um, who, who's like his knowledge of the word of God, of the Bible is out of this world. Like my dad knows the Bible front and back, left and right. And watching it with him is so interesting. Because it brings up so many different concepts. Because his, his initial reaction was like, nah, brah. But his second reaction, he told me recently, he's like, you know what? The more I think of it, the more... Because the, the main thing that took Christians out of the movie is the rock. Rock, yeah, rock, the creatures. rock creatures, yeah. It's the main thing that everyone was like, cool, cool, no. Rock creatures? Right. Really? Right. Rock creatures? Um, but the more he... I talked to my dad about it. He's like, you know, the fallen angel concept. Because there is fallen angels. Mm -hmm. The concept of them turning into demons... Um, coming to Earth and being some sort of demonic presence, but then the way he, Aronofsky did it was them coming to Earth and being like almost like making up for atonement. So they feel so bad about being kicked out of heaven, mm -hmm. fallen angels, that they're like, we're gonna just try and you know help you build the the ark because we messed up and this is our way of atonement. And the way that they formed with the Earth, which is what Aronofsky says in the movie, is very interesting. Like, uh, obviously it's not biblical, but it's very interesting. Right. Um, so that's one thing that stands out to me. And obviously the underlying theme in Noah and in Mother is the, the theme of like the way humanity is, is so cruel and it's so deprived that we, we take God's creation, which is the Earth, which is mm -hmm. God's creation before mankind, um, and we just destroy it. We just shit on it. We kick all over it. We, we just treat the earth like crap. Um, and it's something that we see in both Mother and in Noah. So Right. No, I mean, Noah is um, one of the most experimental um, mainstream releases, I think, I've, mm -hmm. I've seen. Uh, obviously, Russell Crowe um, is in it. Uh, I forget who, who else. Jennifer Conley. Jennifer Conley, yeah. Yeah, yeah shout yeah, out to nice. Rick Green for a Dream for Jennifer Conley. Right. Logan Lerman. Logan Lerman. Uh, Emma, Emma Watson. Emma Watson. Emma yeah. Watson, bro. She's, I love Emma Watson. <laughs> Hermione Granger, bro. <laughs> right, right. And it's just, it's fascinating. Um, and like this, like, um, biblical tale, how he goes, like, reaches so far out in depicting, like, fantasy, um, with the, I, well, I, can, I don't necessarily want to say fantasy, but like, um, the illustration of these rock creatures. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the, the film itself is based on a, a graphic, a French graphic novel um, that he was adapting into the movie. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I was like, it's based on the Bible, bro. Yeah, yeah. It's based on the Bible and it's based on a graphic novel. <laughs> cool, as well. cool. So, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, so I think I think that's where it shares a lot of its like common um, cool. imagery. Um, but I think as as a uh, film in and of itself. Um, you know, it obviously didn't open to much acclaim. Um, you know, the reviews were very mixed. Very, very least. negative reviews. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like you said, for a lot of the Christian audience. Which I don't, um, I, I see again, th I, again, this is me stepping out of a, putting myself out of, because there's so many bubbles that humanity puts themselves into and society mm -hmm. puts themselves into. And it's this whole Christian faith and Christian community that I, I'm always shocked when people who identify themselves as Christian don't like when Hollywood takes biblical things because they're afraid that they're going to change some things. When, as someone who is, doesn't question and say, wait wait a minute, why aren't you just happy that they're bringing up the Bible and they're bringing up concepts to different people who don't know a lot about the Bible, which which to me, that's what Mother is, right? right. Mother is like, this is the story, it should just be called The Story of the Bible by Aronofsky. Right. That's what Mother is. Right. It really is. And, and, I, and if I was a Christian, and as being a Christian, I'd be like, cool. Let's find out what his, what his story of the Bible is. Because like, right. at least it's something that touches on the Word of God and touches on 
biblical teachings, right? right. Um, that to me always baffles me because it's, it's the concept of taking care of the planet, right? Mm-hmm. Where, where to me that's something that's so common sense that I'm surprised that people are offended by that. You know what I'm saying, right? right. That, that Darren Aronofsky has this huge thing of envir- environmentalism mm-hmm. where it's like taking care of your environment, taking care of the planet, you know, climate change, this whole thing, destroying the planet, humanity's destruction of the place that it lives in. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, that's, yeah, why not, dude, right? right? I mean, if you love God that much, if you respect God that much, why wouldn't you take care of your of the planet that he gave you? Like, I don't, I don't know. That, to me, is something that is, is seen throughout the films. And looking back at it, I respect Noah quite a bit. Um, I, I like the concept that he's telling because it is, in a sense, very biblical. The sense of humanity being so deprived and so unrighteous, that's very biblical. Right. And that's why we needed the sacrifice of Christ, right? right. Um, let's jump into Mother a little bit. Well, I was going to say before, real quick, on, on Noah. Um, sure. You know, a lot of technical aspects that are used in Noah um, kind of reflect some of uh, Aronofsky's earlier work. Um, we kind of talked about the hip-hop montage before. He kind of used that. In a way, that that whole like five minute like sequence or like the creation, or uh, of Earth, you know, and and yeah, he has a a lot of very visionary moments. In he that does, movie. man. Yeah, um, you know, uh, just with the the idea of the flood, uh, and weirdly enough, like his portrayal of war and violence almost is kind of like I kind of want to say beautiful, like in the in the in the sense that it really paints a picture of humanity in the sense that. Uh, disagreeing and and how that's going to lead to a downfall, it, how it's going to lead to our downfall, um, you know, he, he ultimately re- uh, repurposes that into how these guys fell to um, get get on the ark, how they how they fell to um, how they fell to abide by um, the word that was given to them by a greater power. Sure. Um, so and that's and that's something we see again in Mother. Right. Um, exactly. With uh, with Mother. So basically, if everyone trying to debate what Mother means, but Mother is a story of the Bible. Yeah. Um, it's Javier Bardem who plays God, um, Jennifer Lawrence who plays Mother Nature, or to be honest, I, I, I'm I'm not a, I'm not the only one who feels this way, but I feel like she also plays like an extension of God. Or a different version of God, but it's okay. it's Mother Nature. But I feel like she she plays two roles, Mother Nature and an extension of God. This is my interpretation. Um, and then Ed Harris comes to the house, which the house that she's taking care of quite a bit, right. um, and completely uninvited. Yeah, um, it's like Adam. Adam. Yeah. And then comes a wife, Eve, played by um, um, Michelle Pfeiffer. Michelle Pfeiffer, Eve, the two sons, Cain and Abel. Mm-hmm. They kill. Um, uh, Cain kills Abel. Uh, showing sin coming into the world. Right. Uh, Michelle Pfeiffer is so curious about this room that they that keep they going te- into. They tell her specifically, do not touch this room. You know, and that do represents not grab the apple. You know, the Garden of Eden, the yeah. forbidden fruit, uh, sin coming into the world with the forbidden fruit, breaking of the forbidden fruit. I'm sorry, right. that that came before Cain and Abel because right. that was the first sin. Right. Um, and then Javier Bardem locking that room to me represented God um, locking up heaven almost being like um you can come on earth and you can live on earth but my paradise is still reserved for me and my wife right for this is this is this is a separate place for me so when he locks it up with the wood with the plywood or whatever right um and then um we see the a a version of the flood which is when they break the counter and when all the people are coming in right and Um, then you notice and it's small detail like after that 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 pipe is broken like when she's kicking people out it's raining outside it is it wasn't raining before exactly so that's that's the flood everyone's out meaning when god killed everyone by doing the flood Mm -hmm. right because he killed everyone except for Noah and his family Mm -hmm. and then re kind of remakes humanity Mm -hmm. and then everyone comes back to the house and then it's god making the new testament right right where where, uh where his wife becomes pregnant his wife becomes pregnant after um creating the new testament and then we yeah, see well, 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 well um, before it was like there, she, he was uh, he was angry at her, and then they had like like revenge sex, and then uh, after she became pregnant, uh, then he started writing. Oh, you're right. right. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah. so you're so, correct. Um, it's like it's 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 like as um, you know, it's like like you said, it's like the New Testament. It's like Jesus being conceptualized, and, and I guess like she in that sense she'll be like uh, you know um, mother mary or, or whatnot the virgin mary and then um in, inspiring in, in, also like inspiring a, a a new leaf i guess you could say for yeah. humanity right right where that's what 
it should be the case, but it isn't the case because guess what? We have some baby killing in this movie. Right, <laughs> Spoilers. Right. Which is, I guess, what is the most controversial thing about this movie, okay. which I didn't see as, as... I mean, obviously it's weird and it's kind of disturbing, but that's I knew that was going to happen. I was like, yeah, there's going to be some baby killing in this movie because... If that's if that baby represents Christ, guess what? Humanity kills Christ. Yeah. Um, that's biblical in itself. Um, and then w- what I like about the movie is that after that whole Bible scenario, we get into more future moments, which is um, war, religion, mm-hmm. the creation of religion. Right? right. When we see that people who who have seen Javier Bardem's character God and who touch Javier Bardem's character of God, they go on to touch other people and be like, hey, God touched me, let me touch you. And that's kind of very Catholic in a way, right. which is the priest kind of representing uh, an extension of God. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a very interesting point because it's, it's almost like a circular motion of, of, of religion leading to war, leading to people saying, hey, I need this, I need that, give me that, give me this, give me that. And it's crazy how this God who wanted to create a relationship with humanity now is is leading to um, so much war and so much destruction that humanity has brought upon earth right. to the point that they're willing to destroy the earth. Um, and it leads to the finale of the movie, which I'm curious to hear your interpretation about the finale. When she goes to the basement, lights it up, and blows up the freaking place. What did you feel that was? Well, I mean, I think that was just like the last book of the Bible, right? Like Revelation. Revelation. Yeah. Uh, that, that's how I feel. It, it's very much Revelation. It's very much the apocalypse, right? right? Where it's like you pushed too far that the earth kills itself. Mm-hmm. Humanity destroys humanity. Mm-hmm. Um, where, which signifies by the flames, the fire, the mm-hmm. um, um, and just the destruction of Earth itself being pushed to the core of Revelation, right? right. It could also signify. I, I'm surprised a lot of people haven't said this. I, I feel like I've the only one that said this, but hell, right? Mm-hmm. The, the flames represent hell. The basement, because yeah, she goes down to yeah. the basement. She goes to the furnace. A name that God, the Bible uses to describe hell is the furnace. Right. Um, so it could be a description of hell as well. And I feel like it, it's such a it's a very ambitious movie. I still feel like The Fountain's more ambitious because to me, I get this. I get the Bible mm-hmm. and The Fountain I still don't get. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I really like what he did. I really like that he brought in these biblical themes in the movie. Right. No, so, it's, it's definitely interesting. And, and I have a copy of the statement he gave to the press. Oh, uh, shit. Uh, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just going to read like one paragraph in particular. I think sure. It's going to help give us a little insight into to what he's, what he's talking about. First off, he starts by talking about how there's nearly 8, million, 8 billion people on Earth. We're facing um, issues of, of the ecosystem, restricting government, uh, you know, climate control, terrorism, all things of that nature. So he, he writes in, in this press release, from this uh, pre, pre-mortal um, soup of angst and helplessness, I woke up one morning and this movie poured out of me uh, like a fever dream. All of my previous films just stayed with me for many years, but I wrote the first draft of Mother in five days. Within a year, we were rolling cameras, and now two years later, um, we have the honor of returning to the uh, Lando for the world premiere. So that's where he had the premiere, obviously. So... Again, he wrote this. He wrote. Yeah, he wrote it in five, five days. days. Apparently, he was very he was, not he was happy with what was going on in the frustrated world. Frustrated in the world, yeah, and and, and uh, you know, it's it, all it's all stuff that makes sense to me. Right, it, it's not it's nothing out of this world to me. Where a lot of people are saying like, well, it's this crazy, you know, lesson that Aronofsky's beating the head over with. Not really. To me, mm-hmm. it's something so essential in the world, taking care of the planet and the destruction of humanity and the Bible, these are all stories that have been told for centuries and thousands of years. Right, but Aronofsky tells it in like a graphic and pretty brutal sure, way. Sure, sure, that's very true. It's interesting. And, you know, I, I think there's like some interesting like side plots that, <laughs> that, that come up in Mother that I think are, are very fascinating, like the whole idea of Kristen Wiig coming in as like the book publicist after, yeah. after he writes the new book and she uh, ends up being like a war profiteer. Sure. Um, I think that speaks to a larger issue of... I, I uh, like, I also like the concept of like war and, yeah. and the concept of how religion has brought in so much war mm-hmm. and how that's not what God intended at all and yet it's what it delivered. And in and, and, and real life, like in humanity, how much wars have been started in the name of God. Right. Um, I love that idea, and the also I also throughout the entire movie I was looking for good. I was like, is there anyone who's good? And we saw two examples of that. One was a soldier 
who saw that she was pregnant and said, hey, come with me, I'll protect you. Oh, right, right, right. And then the other one was, which a little bit more brief, was the doctor who was telling her to breathe, breathe, calm down, it's going to be okay. Just breathe, you got to push. Okay. Remember when she was like yeah, pregnant? Was, yeah. That was the only two good examples of like good human beings, right? right? Where I was like, all right, it's so at least we have a little bit of good where people are willing to do, people are still showing a tiny bit of mercy, mercy towards mother, I guess you can say. Right. Um, and I, I think it's interesting the way the uh, the time in this movie has shifted. Um, obviously, most of the movie is, um, you know, uh, before, if, if we're sticking with the biblical interpretation of it, um, most of it takes place, Old Testament, you know, sure. or just, just her, just the uh, Javier Bardem and, and Jennifer Lawrence just by themselves, you know, it's kind of like mm-hmm. her just being like, and Ed Harris so, yeah. and Michelle Pfeiffer as well, and then, like, eventually coming in, but that's yeah. not until like twenty minutes. Sure, so we look into like the whole timeline of the movie. It's like really the whole thing with uh, um, the Christ baby being born and being eaten happens in like the last fifteen minutes, which sure. is like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Like if you look at the the whole uh, Earth's lifespan um, and just look at the period of time we're in, we're like a tiny like miniature fraction of sure of what what uh, the earth represents but yeah uh, i i mean absolutely yeah and and to me it's it's uh i don't know i i think there's so many other different little things that the movie has to say that i feel um that i personally because again this is our identification with the movie because there probably is like an aronofsky version of what mother means right. but this is what mother means to us um what i saw with the relationship between um, Javier Bardem's God character and um, Jennifer Lawrence's mother is the fact that I feel like they're yin and yang. They're both one and the same, where Javier Bardem is one extension of God being the God of creativity, of obsession with mankind, of an, of an artist, I guess you could say, um, and, and, and Jennifer Lawrence being a God of 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 giving a god of love of god of mercy a god of patience um i i, I don't know i i felt well, like I, I almost kind of think like the opposite of that like, but but also a god of wrath and a god of anger and right. of, because it, it was her that brought about anger and javier bardem's character didn't bring the anger where she was she was much more the 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 emotion in the movie right where she she goes well, from she was the like the focal character she was sure. the one we followed and that's and she was the one that eventually blew everything up right? right because it was the one that she would just had enough mm-hmm. um well and, and i think uh to speak to your point um you know harvey everdown is obviously the one who's like oh yeah we have to forgive them we have to forgive them just, yeah just their thing you know and that's and, very that's very much from the bible because god is constantly forgiving humanity and mankind right and then um but with jennifer lawrence though uh we see her uncomfort from the very beginning yeah right? even even when it's just those two alone um, Aronofsky uses a lot of intense close-ups whenever the camera's sure. on Jennifer Lawrence um, to kind of put you in like a, a you could like feel her emotion, of, yeah, vibe of discomfort, a vibe mm-hmm. of uh, not, and you feel it, <laughs> yeah, you, feel, you feel it from the from the very beginning, and and I think um, again that's the idea of the subjective camera putting you and and her perspective throughout the entire thing. You know, it could have been if this, if this movie was from the perspective of Javier Bardem, it would be uh, very, be different. very different, yeah. yeah. And um, you know, there's a lot. There's there's some different interpretations on on this movie outside of just Christianity. Sure. You know, some people say it's, it's a commentary on, on abuse, domestic abuse. Um, some people say it's uh, something along the lines of the creative process, how that goes along, how people struggle with that, um, yeah. and fame and fortune and whatnot. So. Yeah, I mean, I just feel like it's very much on the nose about the Bible, and, and Darren Aronofsky has not only said it, but he kind of spells it out in the movie um one last thing i want to say about mothers as we close up on this discussion which i feel like is a pretty good discussion right right right, right. right. all right if um it wasn't, let us know in the comments <laughs> please don't yeah. please only happy comments um yeah um i think one last thing i want to say about it i i like that darren aronofsky is willing to give us um the the bible in in a different version mm-hmm. I, I think that's great um one other thing that i wanted to say was um the heart i i I, I forgot the heart of the house the heart of the house to me it's another it can it can mean so many things but to me it means like the 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 constant giving and the constant love that is being held out by mother nature and by um the extension of of humanity and just so much that you're just giving your heart literal heart out um, to me, that that felt that rang true so much with um, 
what I believe to be the story of the Bible, which is the story of love. And if that's ever the case, I feel like at least we saw a glimpse of that in the movie with um, sh- her giving her heart. Right. And I think it's, it's an extension of the themes that we talked about earlier in this show. Um, of course, we see, uh, you know, the idea of motherhood. I mean, you know, it's the title of the movie, Mother, sure. right? It's Mother Nature. It's, it's giving. It's all that. Um, it's all about obsession, her obsession of just being alone. Just leave, leave me alone, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and taking care and, of her house, too. Right. And, and Javier Bardem's obsession and addiction with humankind, with um, being around people, with being supported by people. Um, people who follow him and, and whatnot, and again, um, these are themes that we saw in Black Swan, and The Wrestler, and Requiem for a Dream, and Pi. Just all of these films kind of cumulate into um, into a lot of these themes that, we that he have. he brings up in all of his movies. Right. Yeah. Right, exactly. um, cool. Um, my final words on Aronofsky. Um, I think the guy's a genius. Um, I think he's a master filmmaker. I love what he brings to every movie. I love that he deals with. Um, concepts of life and death and the the meaning of life the purpose of life god creation mm-hmm. is, is a big thing of his as well and he does it in a masterful filmmaking way whether it be score whether it be performances the guy is just honestly one of my favorite filmmakers and i think he's a genius so yeah any final words yeah he's uh he's brilliant i, I think that there aren't a lot of directors who use the craft of of film to the extent that he is willing to push it yeah um we've mentioned a lot about his camera his editing his sound um his portrayal of his characters are what guides us through um, and it's the most powerful thing in each movie of his i believe exactly yeah is the character you're always put into the backseat of the mind of each character each lead character at least and get to see their plight and their struggle and how they are trying to overcome that absolutely Um, you understand everybody's motivation you yep. understand everything they're trying to do and how they, you know, and a lot of times you can visualize it um, going back to like the uh, hallucinations and daydreams and stuff like that. So I think the way Aronofsky, um, as, a, as a pure filmmaker, he's one of the best out there working today. So Cool, man. All right, guys. Um, that was our first episode on Darren Aronofsky. Um, I Hopefully you enjoyed our conversation. Um Guys, we want to make this podcast not just about us, but also about you guys. Let us know what you want to hear about. Let us know what kind of things you want us to dive into. Um, Let us know what filmmakers you want us to talk about. Or let us know what you enjoyed about this conversation. What is your favorite Aronofsky film and why? Make sure you tell us in the comments down below. And make sure you tune in for more episodes of The Meaning Of. Great. That was fun. I think I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun too. Cool, man. All right. Ace and RB3, we are peacing out. Make sure you guys subscribe.